Good day, everyone, and welcome to our presentation of the Paso Robles American Viticultural Areas. My name is Joe Spellman, Master Sommelier with Justin Vineyards, and a longtime fan of Paso Robles. Uh, honored to be with you and going through some beautiful sites and some fantastic uh, vineyards in Paso Robles, courtesy of the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance and its sponsoring wineries. We have a number of different regions to talk about, soils, weather, grape varieties, and eventually wines. So let's start our exploration. We're going to go courtesy of Google Earth to the coast of California, the central coast comprised of Monterey, San Luis Obispo, and Santa Barbara counties primarily, the three largest counties, and hone in to the Paso Robles district in the northern end of San Luis Obispo County. Coastal towns, very cool, very difficult to grow grapes anywhere near there, but in the interior over the Santa Lucia mountain range, we find many great sites in which vineyards have thrived for many decades. First, we're going to fly in and over Highway 46, which heads out to the ocean from the center of Paso Robles at Willow Creek. You can see here all the famous live oak trees that dot the landscape and are the reason Paso Robles is named so. These conical hills at Denner and the James Berry Vineyard, a very famous site, over some more trees. And we're staying out west in Paso Robles moving up to the Adelaide district and some beautiful uh, vineyards as we get there for the famous Tablas Creek and Halter Ranch properties as we head west. Hope this is not too dizzying, but quite a bit uh, farther north and west from the Willow Creek and Templeton areas where we were. And pulling back away, you can see the mountains that border the Adelaide district, that Santa Lucia range, at the heights of which no grapes are grown. Now we're going back east across the broad expanse of the region to the city of Paso Robles, bisected by the Salinas River uh, and its trees surrounding the river. A lot of it is dry during the growing season, but the town's grown quite a bit over the last couple decades. Now we're heading southeast to the El Pomar district. Some great vineyards here, some fantastic settings for fine vineyards uh, for many of the grower producers. Um, and now finally getting out east to the Shalom, uh, Shalom Hills in the northeast corner of Paso Robles and some pretty forbidding mountains behind that. Then we come back swinging out and up and take the view to the west from the eastern edge of Paso Robles across that wide expanse of about 40, 50 miles to the Pacific Ocean. Now going back south again, and we lower our sights, come to the southern point of the Paso Robles AVA overall, which is the Santa Margarita Ranch area. And again, a beautiful development of fantastic vineyards here, protected by the Santa Lucia Range with uh, equal access to ocean breezes, moisture, and wind patterns. And we come back and reside back over the Santa Lucias. Hope you've enjoyed the ride. Really fantastic way to see the wine region, at least the surface of it. And of course, that's all located in the northern third of San Luis Obispo County, about halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles, about 200 miles from either very large city there. Uh, so it's a little harder to get to than some of the North Coast or uh, areas even in the South Coast uh, for the big metropolitan areas, but well worth the ride. And we certainly encourage any professional or wine lover to visit Paso Robles anytime because of the breadth of uh, exciting wineries and culinary delights to be found. So what makes Paso great for grapes? Well, geographic distinctions as seen here in this hearted vineyard, uh, this heart of, uh, of old oak trees in the middle of Niner on a hillside in uh, South Paso. 
to the west. The western border is uh, at the least six miles from the Pacific Ocean. And of course, that varies depending on how far up in a hillside you are uh, as a grower. But the landscape is quite diverse. There are many old river beds that have dried up that create interesting soil patterns and used to create more water patterns than, than they do now. Um, there are some relatively flat parts of Paso Robles, but generally it rolls quite a bit. And of course, mountains define either end, east and west, of the Paso Robles AVA in a broad sense. Uh, the Santa Lucia's to the west, parallel to the Pacific coast, and the La Panza and Shalom Hills in the east and these tend to create uh, a border uh, around which there are very little vineyard uh, activity. So the region's large. It's one of the largest AVAs ever established in California, uh, 42 miles wide east to west and about 30 miles deep north to south at its har uh, deepest point. So Paso Robles, what does it mean? It's the Pass of the Oaks, El Paso de Robles, so named in the 18th century. Uh, the biggest region uh, for the most diverse soils of all AVAs in California at over 600,000 acres. 40,000 different vineyard acres uh, scattered all over these 11 sub-AVAs, over 200 wineries, and that's not even counting some of the virtual or second label wineries uh, as separate wineries, uh, and 64 different varieties known to be grown by all of these grower producers throughout the region. One great advantage Paso Robles has is one of the broadest diurnal temperature shifts uh, from day to night in California. And because we're close to the ocean, as well as have broad expanses uh, of undulating soil uh, all the way through east to west, there are big differences between day and night, uh, and that is very helpful to the vines. One other important factor, there is more calcareous and siliceous soil in Paso Robles than pretty much any other part of vineyard land in California. And this presents great advantages in an area where there's a dearth of volcanic soils or alluvial soils, which are found much more commonly in the North Coast. So Paso Robles as an AVA or American Viticultural Area was established back in 1983. Only 17 operating wineries who got together to propose the region uh, it was approved by what was then the BATF, now known as the TTB, the Tax and Trade Bureau, that controls all of the naming of uh, delimited wine places in California and the rest of the states in the Union. Uh, in 2007, a number of growers and producers felt that Paso Robles was almost too large an AVA, and it was a good idea to think about dividing it into distinct geographical subzones, much as Napa and Sonoma counties have done and other parts of wine production country uh, in California. Uh, over many, many meetings and discussions, the proposal came down to uh, approving 11 sub-AVAs within Paso Robles, all of which, importantly, uh, are permitted to be identified as Paso Robles wines in a general sense. So that conjunctive, la conjunctive labeling uh, law is quite valuable to many growers and producers, particularly if they're crossing over from subregion to subregion. So these 11 subregions uh, are distinctive uh, for their weather patterns, for their soil types, and for the historic practices of grape growing in the regions and the style of wine they produce. And here they are uh, in the uh, almost rectangular map of Paso Robles. Uh, not every part of Paso Robles is delimited by a sub-AVA, but the most important vineyards are included in one or the other of these 11. Uh, from the Adelaida district out west to the Highlands district way out to the east and north to south, the large and productive Estrella district, some of the most traditional uh, and old plantings in the region, uh, all the way down to relatively newly developed Santa Margarita Ranch district, and so many in between. Cooler climates to the west, a little more rainfall and water absorption in the west, uh, that includes Adelaida, uh, Willow Creek, Templeton Gap, um, and to some extent, even parts of El Pomar. Uh, but as you are in the north and the east, far lower rainfall patterns, far different soil types, and generally a different kind of agriculture for grapes. Uh, major roads, Highway 46, goes across the south end 
of uh, the Paso Robles key districts and heads out east uh, past uh, Shandon and ends up up toward Fresno. Um, and north to south, the major highway is Highway 101, coming down from Monterey through San Miguel District and going down through the pass in the hills just to the west of the Santa Margarita District. So in the west, Santa Lucia mountain range, very important because as you can see in this photograph, that fog bank that can regularly come in over the mountains uh, because of the orographic lift, that is the classic patterns coming off the ocean, uh, particularly in the afternoon and evening of bringing uh, moisture up the hill, uh, all that moisture being absorbed by the mountain range, but creating wonderful breezes coming down off the mountains makes it a very different growing area from what we see in the center and east of Paso Robles uh, and capable of doing many uh, great uh, wines as well. So this is overlooking Justin Vineyards and some of the hills there. You can see much of it surrounded by the live oaks uh, and in the background, the Santa Lucia range, which dominates. Now the eastern ranges, a little bit lower lying, a little more rolling, a lot more clay soils here, but also quite an interesting combination of other mineral and uh, 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 old calcareous bases can be found through here. Uh, dotting with trees as well here, but a lot more large properties, much more rolling vineyards, usually higher yielding uh, and quite uh, abundant in certain spots. Now to climate. Paso, of course, is known as a pretty warm place, but I want to prove to you it's cooler than you think. Uh, by the measurements that we take, uh, we feel we find Paso to be just a little bit warmer than Napa Valley over the course of most growing years. And one of the great advantages is this huge difference of temperature day to night. Uh, we might hit 100 or 105 degrees on certain warm days in July, August, uh, but we do get cool overnight, anywhere from 45 to 60 degrees, uh, allowing the vines to rest and repair uh, and then be ready for another day of warmth. So that large diurnal shift, 40 to 45, even 50 degrees at certain times of the year uh, is highly valued for great viticulture. Likewise, rainfall, which is generally low, but is greater in the West. And because we have these regular patterns of fog and mist coming from the Pacific Ocean, there's a little more absorption of water uh, before and after and during the growing season uh, because of the rain shadow created by the orographic lift of, wa of uh, the water and wind coming from the ocean in the mountains. So the wide diurnal temperature shift, uh, the changes of temperature as you go from east to west or west to east, north to south, give us a lot more range of times of harvest and types of grape varieties. So here we're going to show you the Winkler scale and how it is measured in these many sub AVAs or AVAs on their own right, uh, where it's quite cool to the west, influenced highly by the winds coming off the ocean in the Templeton Gap from Morro Bay, um, south of Highway 46, but directly into the Templeton Gap and in and around uh, Willow Creek and Adelaida. Uh, these are also influenced to some extent by winds that come from the north across the San Miguel district uh, and, and the east side, a little less wind affected. But uh, here certainly there is an opportunity for cooler temperatures at night and slower accumulation of heat during the early morning day, uh, parts of the day in Adelaida, Willow Creek, Templeton, where it's region two or three. This is analogous to Bordeaux. Uh, or to Washington State, um, possibly to the Rhone Valley or Rioja. So those kind of grapes are the ones that thrive uh, in Western Paso and have done well historically. A huge mix of Bordeaux and Rhone varieties have done very well. As we move east, uh, again, a little more traditional Zinfandel uh, historically, and a lot of that's given away to large masses of Bordeaux fruit and a lot of growers experimenting with many other varieties. And it's a little bit warmer, regions three and four, particularly to the north in Estrella and San Miguel, and then all the way out into the far east in the shadow of the Shalom Hills in San Juan, Highlands, and Creston. Quite a bit warmer, uh, more analogous to, say, Barossa Valley or St. Helena. Uh, and in Napa Valley, of course, uh, a whole different set of uh, constructs as far as soil, 
heat summation, uh, and so forth. But uh, we're pretty close. And uh, again, the quest to grade is also a defining factor for the Santa Margarita Ranch down in the south. So here's another view of some of these winds I started to talk about. Uh, the northwesterly winds coming off the ocean every day, down south through uh, the Santa Lucias in the northern uh, county of Monterey along the Salinas River, and then downslope winds coming from the east, again, just created by that uh, shift uh, of the natural tendency of accumulating air to rise up over those hillsides in the Sholam Hills and the Panza Range. Temperatures uh, do vary quite a bit uh, between Paso Robles, Napa, and Bordeaux, and generally, though, are consistent, especially in uh, California, the growing years are quite parallel, uh, with Paso being just a little bit warmer than Napa, maybe a degree and a half or maybe a little bit more uh, on average per year. Uh, typically, we will be parallel to the Napa patterns because, again, coastal California is all affected by that same big ocean. Uh, but Bordeaux, a little more erratic and a little bit lower overall in temperature, with typically a lot more rainfall, too. So Bordeaux uh, has always struggled to ripen Cabernet and its related varieties uh, in a consistent way, the way Napa and uh, Paso have been able to do. And there have been dips, a couple of years that were quite a bit cooler in the early 2010s, 10 and 11, but generally we've been on a warm streak since then and have had really successful vintages. And again, rainfall, another factor that we like to look at uh, besides temperature range. So uh, rain here in the West is far more prevalent. And again, this is generally over the winter season rains. Once in a while, there'll be a mid-season rain, quite rare. Uh, and it tends to dry out as we go east. So there's a lot more development of water underground in our calcareous soils in Adelaida and Willow Creek and Templeton Gap, higher elevation, much uh, more rugged country uh, holding that water than far out east where only 11 to 15 inches uh, are accumulating on average over most growing, uh, win growing year winters. Uh, and again, that doesn't mean you can't grow good grapes out there. It just means that all has to be irrigated. But generally, most vineyards are save for a few old traditional uh, Zinfandel and a few uh, Grenache vineyards. So here's uh, another graph that shows uh, uh, the temperature, again, overlaid with the water absorption or the water uh, fall falling uh, throughout Paso Robles. And that has been erratic in Paso too. Typically in coastal California, we'll go through three, four, maybe even five years of drier uh, wet rainfall accumulation. And then, boom, we get a year that's very wet. So 2006 was that way, 2011 was that way, and then several years of dry temperatures. Uh, we've had it actually pretty good couple of years recently, 2016 to 17, really was beneficial with a lot more rainfall than we had seen for five, six years. Therefore, better crops. And anyway, I'm grateful to Jim Jericaris, my colleague at Justin, for helping with those graphs. Soil types. Now, we have a wide range in Paso Robles of different soils, multiple soils that some of which are not found in the North Coast too much. Uh, and then again, we don't have that much of what a lot of the North Coast is made out of, which is volcanic soils. We have some. But uh, generally, this is old sedimentary soils pushed up by tectonic plate movement, the Pacific Ocean plate hitting the North American plate, causing all sorts of soil fracturing and interlaying. And so our core soil that we think is very valuable for grape growing is the calcareous or carbonate rich soils. These are often intermingled with these other types, sandy loam, clay, and silica soils. But the calcareous soils really benefit us because of the way they hold water in an almost sponge-like way down deep below the, the surface level. Uh, as well as being able to provide nutrients. A little bit high pH, as clay soils have, uh, which is also helpful for the vines to retain their acidity. And the grape actually en ending up with a little more crispness than you might expect from a warm region. Uh, the sandy loam soils are beneficial in their mineral ab absorption and their drainability. That is, you want water to go through them and reach down to that uh, calcia calcite rock uh, and create a, a natural almost spring for the subroot uh, vine development. Finally, the silica soils are very helpful with a, a different uh, range of mineral content. 
and also reflecting and holding heat, very useful in the early going in a growing season. However, lower pHs here uh, mean that they're uh, sometimes uh, not the ideal place. So they're usually best where it's mixed in to an overall uh, calcareous soil. Now this is a beautiful uh, rendition of a fantastic vineyard on a hillside with double rows up the steps of this hill uh, showing fantastic uh, setting of vines above those gray white calcareous rocks into which the vines are growing and developing we hope a beautiful wine down the line. Uh, it shows a really nice range of style of soil and vine uh, placement. This is another uh, whole look. This is a dry farm vineyard. As I said, there's only a few of them. Uh, some old vine Zinfandel and some Rhone varieties. Uh, this is an old Grenache vineyard. Again, you can see some of that uh, calcareous soil mixed in with clay here uh, and quite a bit of uh, flavor from these old bush vines or head trained vines uh, that can be very useful for uh, many blends and of course is a core variety for Rhone style wines. Next, I wanted to show you calcareous rock and how it holds water. So the rock on the left is water laden and weighs at least 50% more than the rock on the right, which of course is dry and shows more that chalky white look or yellowish look that we find throughout uh, the calcareous portions of West Paso Robles. So that moisture stays intact throughout most of the growing season and vineyards thrive on it by digging deep into those roots. And uh, it's a fantastic advantage that Paso Robles has over most of the North Coast, the calcareous rock, which make it possible in a warmer zone to be successful with a wide range of varieties. And we go back to the coast for a little quick postcard shot of Morro Bay and Morro Rock uh, and the beginnings of what we would call this sort of classic pattern uh, of moisture and cool air flowing over the Santa Lucia range from the ocean happens every day and creates that interior range of temperature, water, uh, mist, and wind that's quite beneficial in West Paso for grape growing. Now our varieties are quite a huge range. I mentioned 64 different varieties earlier. We're not gonna go through all of them today, but just know that Cabernet Sauvignon is the dominant variety of the region uh, and blended with Merlot and often Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Petit Verdot. Well, there you have the Bordeaux mixture, so to speak, of uh, great varieties and a classic range for making some of the richest wines in California. But of course, we've also become known as a Rhone zone, the Syrah, Grenache, Mourved, uh, Cunoise, multiple other varieties, including many white Rhone varieties have been very successful at different spots in Paso Robles. So we know producers are growing 13 or 14 different Rhone varieties in the same property. And that's a very interesting kind of development, very much like Chateau Neuf du Pop. Um, Old Vine Zinfandel is still around. It has diminished as a percentage of overall production, but Zinfandel as kind of the heritage grape of the region continues to thrive, and there are many very good ones. Dry farmed quite often, uh, and some with some newfangled uh, management principles and very different kind of yield levels and style, ultimately. Uh, so Zin was early in the 19th century, one of the most planted varieties. And as you can see on this graph, a very small percentage, about 6% of overall acreage. Uh, note too, aside from all these other minor varieties that are useful in blending and once in a while a producer will feature on their own, uh, whether they're Eastern European, Austrian, Northern Italian, what have you, uh, these are being worked with by a lot of craft producers who are making less than 5,000 cases of wine a year. Uh, I hesitate to use the word, but that's really the approach if you have a small vineyard uh, and you're using shared space to make a wine, there are limits to how much you can do. So the style of wine coming from some of these small producers can be more energized, more distinctive, and more personal than from uh, some of the large, better known producers that have broad distribution. So if you get a chance to get out there, come visit them because they're offering some wines at cellar door that may not be distributed at all. So. I hope you've enjoyed our little tour of Paso Robles. Uh, I hope you find, like I do, that it's cooler than you thought. And uh, certainly with the number of microclimates, the different soil types, the different grape varieties, and the many approaches to making wine in classic and modern uh, materials, 
Uh, we have an amazing range of product and there's a lot to discover in Paso Robles. So I hope you'll join me in a tasting to find out. Cheers, everyone. Good day, everyone. Glad to join you today in Washington, D.C. and environs and wherever you're tasting some of these beautiful wines from Paso Robles. My name is Joe Spellman, speaking on behalf of the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance. Really thrilled to share some of the great breadth and excitement that's going on in Paso Robles with a wide range of wines, beautiful wines for food and great wines for sipping today. Uh, the range is going to be uh, three actually two white wines and one pink wine, and then three uh, red wines in uh, heightening levels of intensity and power. And I hope you enjoy the tasting today, and uh, well, let's get started. Now our first wine is from a producer I gained a, a lot of appreciation for a couple of years ago called Onyx. Uh, this is their Field Day. Sounds like a field blend, isn't it? And it's supposed, I suppose it is. Multiple varieties are involved in making this wine. Uh, their vineyards out in West Paso are really fantastically set to do many different varieties. Uh, as they're pointing out, a lot of alluvial soils, calcareous rocks, uh, and multiple varieties grown together. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc drives this wine, but really I think aromatically, it's much more about the two uh, lesser percentage varieties, Viognier and Grenache Blanc. All stainless steel fermented. It's beautifully clean, very uh, youthful looking straw, pale straw color. Um, fantastic uh, sheen to the wine. Aromatically, beautiful floral notes, classic Viognier notes, kind of over on top of the citrusy notes we classically get from Sauvignon Blanc. Grenache Blanc, as we'll see, I think is more responsible for body and structure in this wine. But uh, really a fun group of varieties to put together, serve cool. Note that relatively low pH. Uh, this wine uh, is grown in the Templeton Gap uh, on the estate, the Onyx estate, um, and really beautiful package and a lot of fun to taste here. Mm. Uh, this does uh, a little more than your average uh, Sauvignon Blanc based wine in terms of body too. So. Big, rich uh, orchard fruit flavors, lots of length. And I think you really feel that Grenache Blanc come up in the back palate with a kick of acidity. That's very refreshing. Uh, a fantastic wine for early courses in a meal, whether that's ceviche, smoked fish, vegetable courses, even light cheeses, um, goat milk cheeses especially. Uh, really fun wine. Keep it cold. Enjoy it. Spring or summer uh, or Fall or winter, why not? Uh, there's a time for this wine in every meal. You can see what a spectacular estate here from this aerial shot uh, that the Onyx estate occupies. And again, the classic live oaks intermittent uh, between the uh, growths, of the, the uh, planted vineyards in uh, little segments, each by variety and block. All right, our second wine is from Cass Winery. Now Cass is uh, growing Roussan in the Genicio district. So east side of Paso Robles, but certainly a great place to grow Rhone varieties like this. Again, older soils of multiple different types of soils uh, are responsible for this wine. And as we know, Roussan can be one of the most uh, intense and variable aromatic w wines in the white wine range. Uh, of course, classic to the Northern Rhone. Uh, here, I think, in stainless steel fermentation, it's very clean. It's also very young. It's a 2019. Um, and so this wine gives us uh, a lot of those fresh floral notes of Roussan. It hasn't quite developed that honeyed or nutty character that we often associate with the variety in the Rhone or other renditions we've seen in other uh, parts of California or the New World. So uh, long, slow fermentation. 
uh, full mal uh, the malolactic, excuse me, was fully inhibited. So we retain some acidity here. Otherwise, Roussan can be a little bit flabby. Uh, but I find this wine to be very refreshing for Roussan. It's a really good price point for a Roussan. And it's cleanly made uh, from an area you don't really get to, to know a whole lot of uh, as an independent AVA, the Genicio district of Paso Robles. Full flavored, fully dry, mid-length finish, and I think some development still to come for that wine. Now our third wine from one of the most prized properties in West Paso Robles, Tablas Creek Vineyard. Uh, this great uh, range of vineyard produces almost every Rhone grape you can think of uh, and have been real specialists in rosé for several years now too. Uh, this rosé is a pretty uh, big production uh, as an overall uh, uh, portion of Tablas Creek. Uh, over 2,000 cases were made, um, and it's a blend, of course. Uh, Grenache, Mourved, and Cunoise, one of those varieties that Tablas has really helped to establish in Paso Robles, and of course, uh, a key blending grape in Chateau Neuf du Pape, uh, particularly by the Perrin family of Chateau de Beaucastel, which had a lot to do with the establishment <laughs> of Tablas Creek in Paso Robles. When uh, Robert Haas and the Perrins came out there 30 years ago, to start growing great Rhone varieties in West Paso. So Adelaide had grown, but also some of this fruit comes from El Palmar, the Templeton Gap, and even out east in the Creston District. Uh, really a, a delicate rosé, very, the very lightest pink in color, very brief uh, maceration for color extraction, very fresh, a touch of uh, maybe uh, herbal character in the nose, uh, along with those classic uh, white flower aromas we get out of a young rosé. Very delicate. Perhaps I'm drinking it a little too cold. Uh, hard to pull out that nose. It's not jumping out, it's delicate. Mm. Really develops nicely on the palate. Layers all those beautiful flavors of Grenache, a great source for a pink wine. And then a bit of that hard edge from Mourved. A uh, little goes a long way there. Uh, can't tell exactly what the Cunois component does, but I'm glad it's there. <laughs> uh, really pretty wine, very, very dry. Dry rosé, very lean, but delivers a lot of body. Uh, and I think a beautifully uh, developed wine uh, at a year old now. Uh, perfect for drinking right now with all manner of uh, seafood or vegetable courses. So our next uh, sequence, and there's, of course, the uh, organically grown uh, vineyards managed uh, biodynamically actually with these sheep surrounding the vineyard on a regular basis. You can see in West uh, Paso, uh, uh, Adelaide, uh, rolling hills, lots of exposure of different soils and this must be in late winter where uh, uh, the grass is growing and those animals love it. So that's the beginning of the biodynamic cycle in West Paso. So I'm not going to pour our three reds. Uh, first up will be the Clos Selen, a fantastic blend, again, uh, rather uh, ronish, I suppose you could say, uh, a GSM. I hate to use the term since they don't really, but um, this combines the three key varieties that you would find in the Rhone, Grenache, Syrah, and Mourved, uh, much darker in color than you would expect for a Grenache wine in uh, most of the Rhone. Uh, but purple all the way to the edge, throwing a little bit of uh, sheeting on the side, so some thicker tears, but uh, in the nose, vibrant, exciting, peppery, a lot of red fruit here. Um, the Syrah contributes a little more dark fruit, and Mourved, often responsible for kind of a tarry or an earthy note, some of that pops through too. As the wine swirls and opens, and again, it's a 2018, very youthful, um, the Closelin, Harmonie gives us a, a really abrupt sort of sense of spice here and uh, a wonderful wine. Neutral barrels, so there's no oak influence uh, and it will hang in for a few years. Flavor profile. Clean, open, red fruit, uh, almost a tiny bit jammy. I hesitate to use the word 
but it has that nice cut in the middle coming from the Syrah and Mourvedre that give it much more backbone than a straight Grenache would have uh, in Paso. And where do you see this vineyard? It's spectacular. Hilly, rolling, uh, set up on hilltops in between groves of live oaks and a wonderful setting to grow uh, these three varieties. Uh, Armonie, indeed, is a great name for a wine that has this kind of expression. Next, we have Jada Vineyard. Their wine called Straits. Uh, and this is a, a primarily Merlot, but a Bordeaux blend with a little Petit Syrah, which of course you'd never see in Bordeaux, but is often used in Paso for deepening, lengthening, uh, strengthening, and darkening uh, a lot of Bordeaux variety blends. And uh, I think it's good use for Petit Syrah, frankly, even only 6%. Um, so again, an organically grown, biodynamic, and sustainable farm. Uh, lots of uh, use of, of new oak here, uh, 16 months and 39% new French barrels. Very small production. Uh, under 500 cases were produced of the Straits. And it's nice to see a Merlot-driven wine uh, so aromatically interesting and so intense and structured across the palate. Nose-wise, well, start with the visual. Visual-wise, it's starting to show a little development of color at the edge. Um, we're getting stained tears at the side of the glass. Uh, and in the nose, a lot of that classic red fruit uh, and black fruit note almost a licorice note from the Merlot. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, contributes some of that darker fruit. Uh, a lot of spice in the wine. A bit of cinnamon and nutmeg, and I suppose that's an oak-related note. Big uh, kind of almost olive, black olive uh, component. Mm. Really beautiful entry flavors. Layers beautifully across the palate, sticks to each part of the tongue in a nice way, uh, and fills the mouth with a really pleasurable explosion of fruit and very modest tannins. So I find that the, the blend here is quite successful in delivering the classic richness of Paso Robles with the delicacy that we often see of Merlot in, in Paso. So uh, really enjoyed tasting this wine. Congratulations to winemaker uh, Joshua Hart. Uh, for producing something so beautiful from what is obviously a wonderful setting uh, in central Paso Robles, looking toward the west here, uh, where that fog bank is starting to roll in. What a beautiful wine, and uh, a great way to uh, think about Paso a little differently, where Merlot is a very serious variety. Now our third big red here is going to be the Austin Hope 2018. Of course, this is... Uh, one of the real trademark wines of the Hope family, which produces multiple different labels in the West Paso. Um, this uh, is a, a beautiful series of sources of Paso Cab in Adelaida and other regions, Creston, El Pomar, Genicio, 100% Cabernet, uh, and handled differently in terms of barreling uh, post-fermentation. So a lot of the barrels uh, were older barrels in the initial maturation after fermentation. Then after the blend was established, uh, about 65% uh, uh, became new barrel, 75%, excuse me, is new barrel uh, aged uh, for a very long period, uh, up to two years, not quite two years. And uh, serious wine, big d depth of color, uh, beautiful robe, as we like to say. Some of those really wonderful, sweet, almost super ripe characters of Cabernet Sauvignon and Paso come through here. And of course, a pretty generous style in terms of alcohol and richness. Um, it has a fantastic layering. Mm. And even a little sense of sweetness in the back palate. So I find this wine to be one of the real signature wines of West Paso, uh, and Austin Hope's been doing a wonderful job with Cabernet in this label for several years now. And there's the humble abode, or at least the old tasting room area and outdoor uh, service area at the Austin Hope Winery. Uh, again, well worth a visit in West Paso, 
one of the most beautiful settings in wine country. Hope you enjoyed the wines and we'll make more. So thanks for joining us.